Chapter 24 The Birthday Celebration A clear, perfect day, with a gentle breeze and a sunny sky, greeted Princess Ozma as she wakened next morning, the anniversary of her birth. While it was yet early, all the city was astir, and crowds of people came from all parts of the land of Oz to witness the festivities in honor of their girl ruler's birthday. The noted visitors from foreign countries, who had all been transported to the Emerald City by means of the magic belt, were as much a show to the Ozites as were their own familiar celebrities, and the streets leading from the royal palace to the jeweled gates were thronged with men, women, and children to see the procession as it passed out to the green fields where the ceremonies were to take place. And what a great procession it was! First came a thousand young girls, the prettiest in the land, dressed in white muslin, with green sashes and hair ribbons, bearing great baskets of red roses. As they walked, they scattered these flowers upon the marble pavements, so that the way was carpeted thick with roses for the procession to walk upon. Then came the rulers of the four kingdoms of Oz, the Emperor of the Winkies, the Monarch of the Munchkins, the King of the Quadlings, and the Sovereign of the Gillikins, each wearing a long chain of emeralds around his neck to show that he was a vassal of the ruler of the Emerald City. Next marched the Emerald City Coronet Band, clothed in green and gold uniforms and playing the Ozma Two-Step. The Royal Army of Oz followed, consisting of twenty-seven officers from the Captain General down to the lieutenants. There were no privates in Ozma's army because soldiers were not needed to fight battles, but only to look important, and an officer always looks more imposing than a private. While the people cheered and waved their hats and handkerchiefs, there came walking the royal Princess Ozma, looking so pretty and sweet that it is no wonder her people love her so dearly. She had decided she would not ride in her chariot that day, as she preferred to walk in the procession with her favored subjects and her guests. Just in front of her trotted the living blue bear rug, owned by old Dinah, which wobbled clumsily on its four feet, because there was nothing but the skin to support them, with a stuffed head at one end and a stubby tail at the other. But whenever Ozma paused in her walk, the bear rug would flop down flat upon the ground for the princess to stand upon until she resumed her progress. Following the princess stalked her two enormous beasts, the cowardly lion and the hungry tiger. And even if the army had not been there, these two would have proved powerful enough to guard their mistress from any harm. Next marched the invited guests, who were loudly cheered by the people of Oz along the road, and were therefore obliged to bow to right and left almost every step of the way. First was Santa Claus, who, because he was fat and not used to walking, rode the wonderful sawhorse. The merry old gentleman had a basket of small toys with him, and he tossed the toys one by one to the children as he passed by. His rills and nooks marched close behind him. Queen Zixi of Ix came after, then John Doe and the Cherub, with the rubber bear named Para Bruin strutting between them on its hind legs. Then the Queen of Maryland escorted by her wooden soldiers, then King Bud of Noland and his sister, the Princess Fluff, then the Queen of Ev and her ten royal children, then the braided man and the candy man, side by side then King Dox of Foxville, and King Kickabray of Dunkerton, who by this time had become good friends, and finally Johnny Dewitt in his leather apron, smoking his long pipe. These wonderful personages were not more heartily cheered by the people than were those who followed after them in the procession. Dorothy was a general favorite, and she walked arm in arm with the Scarecrow, who was beloved by all. Then came Polychrome and Button Bright, 
and the people loved the rainbow's pretty daughter and the beautiful blue-eyed boy as soon as they saw them. The shaggy man in his shaggy new suit attracted much attention because he was such a novelty. With regular steps tramped the machine TikTok, and there was more cheering when the Wizard of Oz followed in the procession. The Wogglebug and Jack Pumpkinhead were next, and behind them Glinda the Sorceress and the Good Witch of the North. Finally came Belina with her brood of chickens, to whom she clucked anxiously to keep them together and to hasten them along so they would not delay the procession. Another band followed, and this time the tin band of the Emperor of the Winkies played a beautiful march called There's No Place Like Tin. Then came the servants of the royal palace in a long line, and behind them all the people joined the procession and marched away through the emerald gates and out upon the broad green. Here had been erected a splendid pavilion, with a grandstand big enough to seat all the royal party and those who had taken part in the procession. Over the pavilion, which was of green silk and cloth of gold, countless banners waved in the breeze. Just in front of this, and connected with it by a runway, had been built a broad platform, so that all the spectators could see plainly the entertainment provided for them. The wizard now became master of ceremonies, as Ozma had placed the conduct of the performance in his hands. After the people had all congregated about the platform, and the royal party and the visitors were seated in the grandstand, the wizard skillfully performed some feats of juggling glass balls and lighted candles. He tossed a dozen or so of them high in the air, and caught them one by one as they came down, without missing any. Then he introduced the Scarecrow, who did a sword-swallowing act that aroused much interest. After this, the Tin Woodman gave an exhibition of swinging the axe, which he made to twirl around him so rapidly that the eye could scarcely follow the motion of the gleaming blade. Glinda the Sorceress then stepped upon the platform, and by her magic made a big tree grow in the middle of the space, made blossoms appear upon the tree and made the blossoms become delicious fruit, called tamornas. And so great was the quantity of the fruit thus produced, that when the servants climbed the tree and tossed it down to the crowd, there was enough to satisfy every person present. Parabruin, the rubber bear, climbed to a limb of the great tree, rolled himself into a ball and dropped to the platform, whence he bounded up again to the limb, he repeated this bouncing act several times, to the great delight of all the children present. After he had finished, he bowed and returned to his seat. Glinda waved her hand and the tree disappeared, but its fruit still remained to be eaten. The good witch of the north amused the people by transforming ten stones into ten birds, the ten birds into ten lambs, and the ten lambs into ten little girls, who gave a pretty dance, and were then transformed into ten stones again, just as they were in the beginning. Johnny Dewitt came next on the platform, with his tool chest, and in a few minutes built a great flying machine, then put his chest in the machine, and the whole thing flew away together, Johnny and all after he had bid good-bye to those present and thanked the princess for her hospitality. The wizard then announced the last act of all, which was considered really wonderful. He had invented a machine to blow huge soap bubbles as big as balloons, and this machine was hidden under the platform so that only the rim of the big clay pipe to produce the bubbles showed above the flooring. The tank of soap suds and the air pumps to inflate the bubbles were out of sight beneath, so that when the bubbles began to grow upon the floor of the platform, it really seems like magic to the people of Oz, who knew nothing about even the common soap bubbles that our children blow with a penny clay pipe and a basin of soap water. The wizard had invented another thing. Usually soap bubbles are frail and burst easily, lasting only a few moments as they float in the air. But the wizard added a sort of glue to his soap suds, 
which made his bubbles tough, and as the glue dried rapidly when exposed to the air, the wizard's bubbles were strong enough to float for hours without breaking. He began by blowing, by means of his machinery and air pumps, several large bubbles, which he allowed to float upward into the sky, where the sunshine fell upon them, and gave them iridescent hues that were most beautiful. This aroused much wonder and delight, because it was a new amusement to everyone present, except perhaps Dorothy and Button Bright, and even they had never seen such big, strong bubbles before. The wizard then blew a bunch of small bubbles, and afterward blew a big bubble around them, so that they were left in the center of it. Then he allowed the whole mass of pretty globes to float into the air and disappear in the far distant sky. That is really fine, declared Santa Claus, who loved toys and pretty things. I think, Mr. Wizard, that I shall have you blow a bubble around me. Then I can float away home and see my country spread out beneath me as I travel. There isn't a spot on earth that I haven't visited, but I usually go in the night time, riding behind my swift reindeer. Here's a good chance to observe the country by daylight while I'm riding slowly at my ease. Do you think you will be able to guide the bubble? asked the wizard. Oh, yes, I know enough magic to do that, replied Santa Claus. You blow the bubble with me inside of it, and I'll be sure to get home in safety. Please send me home in a bubble, too, begged the Queen of Maryland. Very well, madame. You shall try the journey first, politely answered old Santa. The pretty wax doll bade goodbye to the Princess Ozma and the others, and stood on the platform while the wizard blew a big soap bubble around her. When completed, he allowed the bubble to float slowly upward, and there could be seen the little Queen of Maryland standing in the middle of it, and blowing kisses from her fingers to those below. The bubble took a southerly direction, quickly floating out of sight. That's a very nice way to travel, said Princess Fluff. I'd like to go home in a bubble, too. So the wizard blew a big bubble around Princess Fluff, and another around King Bud, her brother, and a third one around Queen Zixi, and soon these three bubbles had mounted into the sky and were floating off in a group in the direction of the kingdom of Noland. The success of these ventures induced the other guests from foreign lands to undertake bubble journeys also. So the wizard put them one by one inside his bubbles, and Santa Claus directed the way they should go, because he knew exactly where everybody lived. Finally, Button Bright said, I want to go home too. Why, so you shall, cried Santa, for I'm sure your father and mother will be glad to see you again. Mr. Wizard, please blow a big fine bubble for Button Bright to ride in and I'll agree to send him home to his family as safe as safe can be. I'm sorry, said Dorothy with a sigh, for she was fond of her little comrade. But perhaps it's best for Button Bright to get home, cause his folks must be worrying just dreadful. She kissed the boy, and Ozma kissed him too, and all the others waved their hands and said goodbye, and wished him a pleasant journey. Are you glad to leave us, dear? asked Dorothy, a little wistfully. Don't know, said Button Bright. He sat down cross-legged on the platform with his sailor hat tipped back on his head, and the wizard blew a beautiful bubble all around him. A minute later, it had mounted into the sky, sailing toward the west, and the last they saw of Button Bright. He was still sitting in the middle of the shining globe and waving his sailor hat at those below. Will you ride in a bubble, or shall I send you and Toto home by means of the magic belt? The princess asked Dorothy. I guess I'll use the belt, replied the little girl. I'm sort of afraid of those bubbles. Bow wow, said Toto approvingly. He loved to bark at the bubbles as they sailed away, but he didn't care to ride in one. Santa Claus decided to go next. He thanked Ozma for her hospitality and wished her many happy returns of the day. Then the wizard blew a bubble around his chubby little body and smaller bubbles around each of his rills and nooks. 
As the kind and generous friend of children mounted into the air, the people all cheered at the top of their voices, for they loved Santa Claus dearly. And the little man heard them through the walls of the bubble, and waved his hands in return, as he smiled down upon them. The band played bravely, while everyone watched the bubble until it was completely out of sight. How about you, Polly? Dorothy asked her friend. Are you afraid of bubbles, too? No, answered Polychrome, smiling. But Santa Claus promised to speak to my father as he passed through the sky. So perhaps I shall get home an easier way. Indeed, the little maid had scarcely made this speech when a sudden radiance filled the air. And while the people looked on in wonder, the end of a gorgeous rainbow slowly settled down upon the platform. With a glad cry, the rainbow's daughter sprang from her seat and danced along the curve of the bow, mounting gradually upward, while the folds of her gauzy gown whirled and floated around like a cloud and bended with the colors of the rainbow itself. Goodbye, Ozma. Goodbye, Dorothy, cried a voice they knew belonged to Polychrome. But now the little maiden's form had melted wholly into the rainbow, and their eyes could no longer see her. Suddenly, the end of the rainbow lifted, and its colors slowly faded like mist before a breeze. Dorothy sighed deeply and turned to Ozma. I'm sorry to lose Polly, she said, but I guess she's better off with her father. "'cause even the land of Oz couldn't be like home to a cloud fairy. "'No, indeed,' replied the princess. "'But it has been delightful for us to know Polychrome for a little while, "'and who knows, perhaps we may meet the Rainbow's Daughter again some day. "'The entertainment being now ended, "'all left the pavilion and formed their gay procession back to the Emerald City again. "'Of Dorothy's recent traveling companions, only Toto and the Shaggy Man remained.' and Ozma had decided to allow the latter to live in Ozma for a time at least. If he proved honest and true, she promised to let him live there always, and the shaggy man was anxious to earn this reward. They had a nice quiet dinner together, and passed a pleasant evening with the scarecrow, the tin woodman, Tick-Tock, and the yellow hen for company. When Dorothy bade them good night, she kissed them all goodbye at the same time for Ozma had agreed that while Dorothy slept, she and Toto should be transported by means of the magic belt to her own little bed in the Kansas farmhouse, and the little girl laughed as she thought how astonished Uncle Henry and Aunt Em would be when she came down to breakfast with them the next morning. Quite content to have had so pleasant an adventure, and a little tired by all the day's busy scenes, Dorothy clasped Toto in her arms and lay down upon the pretty white bed in her room in Ozma's royal palace. Presently, she was sound asleep.